Good morning. We have some selections from Psalm 95 and 96 this morning. Oh, come and let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Father, thank you that we get to proclaim the good news of your salvation from day to day. We want to do that today. We want to do that this morning. We want to do that this very minute. We want to do that all the days of our lives. And so, Lord, here we are thanking you for this day, purposing to be joyful, purposing to let the joy of the Lord be our strength today. So, Lord, we give you our lives, we give you ourselves, we give you our hopes, our dreams. We give you everything that we are, and we know that we can trust you because you are a God whose compassion goes beyond the sky. So, Lord, here we are. We thank you for this day. Let the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart be acceptable, be approved even in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in the precious, mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.
choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. We choose you, Lord, our cheer. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify in the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify in the name of all names. That nothing can stand against.
Hallelujah again. Hallelujah. Do we believe what we just sang? Do we believe what we just sang? Jesus, the name above every name. In his name, there is power, there is healing, there is life. I just want you, everybody in this room must have someone that know that they know that has an addiction, that needs life, that needs healing, that needs power, the power of Jesus in their life to be seen, to be seen in this day. If Jesus did it then, why doesn't he now do it? He does do it now. He does do it now. He does bring, he breaks the, ch the chains and the shackles off our lives. Jesus, we just come to you right now, everyone, with someone's name in their mind. Jesus, we bring to you that person in our mind. Lord, maybe it's even me, God, that needs your chains to be broken, any strongholds to be broken off in my life so that I can have life and have it to the full like you promised. God, anyone that's in my heart that needs healing, that needs to see the power of God move in healing, the name of Jesus. We speak your name, Jesus, over that person, over that situation. And we declare, God, that you are more than enough, more than enough. And we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's believe it and see God move. Amen. 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 Well, the kids, you're here today. You stay in the service, but everybody else, you get to greet someone, and we welcome you to the Church of the Living God. If this is your first time, we have a welcome center out, uh, someone to greet you after the service, but greet one another now. morning church family i love this all right so as we start getting settled i have a lot of announcements for you it's really exciting september is full of different things also going into the fall we continue to have more but i want to highlight two does everyone have their green sheets all your announcements perfect two you ready as i say them i want you to get excited and cheer for them okay family connect Woo! all right CLG's 40th anniversary. All right, so Family Connect. It's a good time. Families can come together, hang out, get some wisdom. Also, we have another great couple sharing this, uh, this month, and uh, it's pretty much 15 minutes. They share for 15 minutes, just a little wisdom, and then the rest of it's hanging out, community, eating. It's a good time. But we need volunteers. All right, during those 15 minutes, there's child care so that the parents can focus and just enjoy themselves. So there's child care, but we need people to volunteer for that. So if you look, there's the QR code. What you do is you take your phone, all right? Show I'm showing. <laughs> I went over with Pastor Chris already this week, but he needs a refresher. All right, you take your phone and you just scan it. You just highlight and you tap and then it's a link. All right? So, it's really cool. Everything you need is online. Any information you need, right there. So, do the QR codes. And then the next one, 
CLG's 40th anniversary, guys. This is so exciting. So we are going to celebrate big, all right? For this one, there is the QR code. So same thing, scan your camera over it, click it. You'll get the, the, uh, the, the link to go over to the website. But also today, we have the clipboards. If all the people in the front can grab the clipboards, and we're going to start passing clipboards back. There's two in the center ones, and then there's one on each side. So as it comes by, you look. If your name's already there, that means you signed up. Thank you. We appreciate it. But if your name's not there, sign up for something. We need some help to get it all together. It'll be a good celebration. All right? Ushers, can you guys come forward? If you also can't figure out the QR code still, please come talk to me. I'll help you, all right? I get it. It's just sometimes hard. So please, come up to me. I'll work with you. Sometimes phones are different, but uh, we'll work on it together, all right? Hey, Jim. Thank you, Father God, the maker and creator, the lover of our souls. And thank you to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who out of his word come streams of living water. And so, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, we just sanctify these tithes and offerings for the furtherance of your kingdom. Multiply them, O Lord Jesus, just like you did with the bread. In Jesus' name, amen. All stand together. Oh my God, the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun said.
of you are sitting there going, he's forgot something. <laughs> We're going to do communion at the tail end of the message because what uh, I want to talk to you about this morning leads us right to the communion table. So uh, if you are gluten-free and you uh, would like to share in communion, we have cups in the back of uh, the sanctuary and you can either go and get one of those yourself or you can raise your hand and one of the ushers will find you. I, I was talking to um, Pastor Justin uh, you know, about the fall and coming into uh, September and trying to gain his heart in regards to where we were going as a, as a church. We've had a great summer talking about the one another's. How many of you have been blessed by just that study and that challenge to really, really become a people who are just doing the one another's well? Well, in the midst of that, he, in that conversation, he just felt like coming into this 40th year celebration that we're going to be doing on the 17th, that September was going to be a month of celebration. It was going to be a month of remembering what God has, has done in our midst. You know, 40 years of fruitful ministry here at CLG. And uh, wouldn't you agree with me that there is so much for us to be grateful for and thankful for in regards to our lives personally, but then also in regards to this church corporately. God has done so many marvelous things, and it's going to be a, a month of just thinking about that and celebrating that. You know, on the way to church today, uh, by, by uh, the way that I came, I drove by the Roberts, Robertson School, where, where this church had its early beginnings. And I just stopped for a minute. I had to because there was a stoplight. And <laughs> while I stopped, I was looking right at the school, and I just, I just said, Father, thank you for the beginnings of CLG in that place that you opened a door and uh, there were faithful people who had a vision to start a church in the Manchester area and now 40 years down the road, there's so much that has taken place and so much that has been done. I mean, the facility that we're in right now is just, again, the, the expression of the promise and the goodness of God. And think about the renewal services. How many of you uh, have been been impacted by that season of renewal that swept through CLG. So there, there's so many more things that I could mention, but, but today I want to talk about something that I think is, is super important. Now, Pastor Justin asked me to launch this, these thoughts uh, because he and Emily are in western New York over by where we used to live in a little place called Lima. They were uh, at a wedding celebration of some friends, and so they're gone for the weekend, but they will be back. And, uh, and uh, so he said, hey, kick it off, Chris, and, and let's get rolling. So would you join me? Grab your Bibles or your app uh, on your phone. Uh, how many of you are grateful that Jeremy showed us how to use a QR code? <laughs> I, I looked around, and everybody my age was like this. I try to do those QR codes, and I'm like, anyway. Genesis chapter 12. Find your way over there. I want to talk about altars that alter today. When I talk about an altar, I'm going to try to give some definition in regards to what I mean by that, and it's going to walk us right into the communion table today. But I want to talk for a moment about the life of Abraham, or Abram, as it starts out. And in Genesis chapter 12, we read, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through your name. Or through you. So Abraham left. And then jump down uh, to verse 6. And it says, Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Now, I want you to note that in your Bibles. 
Remember, the Lord says, I'm bringing you into a place of promise. I'm bringing you into a place where you're going to be blessed. I'm bringing you into something that, that only I can do, and wherever you go, you will be a blessing. And so Abraham follows the leading of the Lord, and he goes to the place of God's promise. And in the text, it says, when he gets there, he finds out that the Canaanites are in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land, the land where the Canaanites are. I will give this land. And so what did he do? He built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he went on uh, toward the hills east of Bethel. And there he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there again, he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now look at verse 10. It says, now there was a famine in the land. Everybody say famine. Amen. When it says famine in the land, it says it was in the land. And it says he went down to Egypt to live there for a while he left the place of God's promise and he went down to Egypt for a while because the famine was severe. Now that word severe, uh, it can mean uh, extremely bad. It can mean uh, intense. It can mean uh, unpleasant. It's, it's a cause for fear or anxiety. Or as my grandson Hudson says, it was really yucky. <laughs> but he left the place of promise because things became Intense. Anybody ever had an intense situation in your life? Well, that's what's happening here. And he leaves and walks into even more trouble. We don't have time to explore the whole story. But he is, he's going into Egypt. He looks at his wife, Sarai, and it says she was really pretty. She was really beautiful. And he says, you know what? Your beauty is going to get me in trouble. And if we go in and the men of Egypt see your beauty and realize that you're my wife, they're going to want you for themselves, and so they'll kill me. So here's the plan. You pretend to be my sister. There's an idea. There, you be my sister. And all the wives said, yucky. yucky. And so they launched this plan, but that plan gets them in trouble. But I want you to note that the Lord was still with him, carried him through, got him out. And it says in, ver in chapter 13, it says, so Abram went up from Egypt. He finally left. He headed back to the Negev with his wife and everything he had. Lot went with him. And it says, Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. And from the Negev, he went from place to place until. Everybody say, until. He's wandering now. He's nomadic. He's forgotten the promise of God. He's wandering around from place to place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier. And he finally arrives back to the place where his first altar was built. And it says that Abram called on the name of the Lord. In studying the, the scripture, primarily the Old Testament scripture, but somewhat in the New Testament, I like to observe how God interacts with individuals, how he works in men and women's lives, those who are godly, those who are pursuing him. And one of the observations that I have made is that, that they have these intense encounters with God, where God comes and he intersects with their lives. And from that point, there is a pivot and the course of their destinies are set into a new direction. And so I call that 
building altars or building an altar to the Lord. Now, when I say altar, obviously, maybe some of us think of, you know, a piece of furniture or, or maybe you've seen, you know, you've gone into an ornate uh, uh, cathedral and seen the altars there that are, that are just beautiful and magnificent. Or maybe even you, you considered when I said the word altar, those times where you've come to the front of the platform here and, and made an altar with the Lord, an encounter with God that, that has been life-changing and all of those are, are okay understandings. But what I want to talk to you about uh, in the next few minutes is something a little different. I want to talk to you about those moments when God steps in and he begins to alter the direction of a person's life. Where he begins to change the fabric of that person's character and begins to shape that person's realization of destiny. So I'm not talking simply about coming forward in a worship service because there's been an altar call. As significant as that has been, and I'm sure every one of us in this room at one time or another have responded to the urging of the Spirit. We've responded to the moving of God in a meeting and we've come forward and we've either consecrated ourselves or given ourselves in a certain dimension. But I want to go a little deeper than that. I want to talk about those moments when you've been on the threshold of God's power and it's being poured out, it's those life-changing moments. It's those, those moments where you are encountering, watch me now, encountering the living God. And because you're encountering the living God, something of a living faith is awakened in you so that then you can move forward in a living relationship with God, not a, a dead works relationship, not a, 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 a relationship with God that is just going through religious motions, but a living relationship with the living God that is life transforming in your living experience. Amen. It's where Christ's lordship is just expanded in your life and his glory is poured out into your life, shaping you for eternity. Those moments when you came forward and you knew that you were apart from God, but then you had an encounter with God and you were born again and you were changed for eternity. I'm talking about those kind of moments. I'm talking about those kind of moments where, where you hear the call of God resonating in your heart and, and you can't do anything but rise up and respond to what God's doing in that moment. And from that moment on, everything changes for you. The, the, your, 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 your viewpoints on life, your, your character begins to change and form. There's a moment of transformation. Why? Because you have been in the presence of the living God. I'm talking about those kind of moments. Those moments where you're called into the marketplace to be someone who goes into the marketplace not just to make money, but to impact nations. I'm talking about those calls where you encounter God to such a degree that you're saying, I will never be the same again. And, and because of that, you answer the call to go to a nation that nobody else wants to go to and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about those kind of moments. Encounters where you build an altar with God. Those kind of altars, those kind of moments are for me threshold moments. They are where a memorial is set up and where we say that is where God met me. Because altars like that create in us new capacities within us. Larger channels of God's grace begin to flow in you and to you and through you. There's a powerful conduit of the Holy Spirit influencing you for God's glory. And when you look at the life of Abraham, you see Abraham's fruitfulness in life came through a succession of altars, dynamic encounters with God. Everyone changing him changing the fabric of his life. And I want to submit to you as a congregation that God wants to have altars with you. He wants to have encounters with you. He wants to meet with you, not just on a Sunday morning, but, but a Monday afternoon. He wants to meet with you and change you for his glory and for his honor. 
And so at the core of our, your relationship with God, there needs to be, and here's where I'm going, there needs to be in you, there needs to be in me a readiness to meet God personally. Not some kind of thing where, where God wants to have an encounter with us and we rationalize it away. Although I don't think that's God. I think it's the pepperoni pizza that I ate. No, I'm talking about having this, this, this desire within us that says, I want to meet with God. I want to submit to the Holy Spirit's relentless operations in my life. I want to give myself over without rationalizing away what God is doing in my life, but being totally submitted and ready for whatever God is asking me to do. When we celebrate communion, we are celebrating the grandest altar of all. When we come to the table of the Lord, we can allow it to either be just some kind of a dry ritual that we go through. Check the box, first Sunday of the month, we did it, let's move on. And that's not what we do here at CLG. Instead, we approach the table of the Lord and we, we remember that this is an altar commemorating the cross of Calvary where the Son of God offered the ultimate sacrifice and his work on the cross reconciled all mankind to God, made possible for our lives to be infused with meaning and for our sins to be forgiven and to give us the promise of eternal life. I want you to get ready because in a few minutes, when we come to the table of the Lord, I believe that what God wants to do in this moment of time is to encounter us afresh. As you hold the bread in your hand, as you take the cup in your hand, don't let it just be something that you do because it's the first Sunday of the month. Prepare your heart even now to say, God, as I take the elements, I desire to have an encounter with your holy presence. I desire to meet with you in this moment of time. When I was thinking about this, I thought about a, an encounter that both Joan and I had. We had been at a, a, a worship service, uh, and, and, and during the worship service at the time, Joan and I were kind of living on the fence. We had kind of one foot in the kingdom, one foot outside of the kingdom. We were kind of surfing. So we thought, well, in church we know how to behave, but outside of the church we know how to misbehave. And that was kind of my upbringing, you know. I, I had been brought up in a, in a, in a system where you, you went to, to confession on Saturday, you behaved yourself on Sunday, but then on Monday you went surfing. And had your way. You did whatever you wanted to do. And so that's, that's kind of how Joan and I were navigating. We knew Jesus. We knew about Jesus. But, but we really weren't living for him. And so we're at this worship service and the Lord speaks to us. And this is what the Lord said. He said, I will not contend with you forever. Now, he said it to Joan privately, and he said it to me privately. Now, here's where the altar came. We're on our way home back to Cape Cod. And the car is completely quiet. Now, can you imagine a car drive with Chris and Joan Wood being absolutely quiet? <laughs> but we were stunned. We were stunned with the way God was encountering us. And Joan said to me, she said, Chris, did something happen in church today? And I said, well, I think I heard God. And she said, what did he say? And I said, he said, and I said, I don't understand this. He said that he was not going to contend with me forever. And Joan's face went white. And she said he said the same thing to me. That night when we got home, we made an altar to the Lord. It was a riveting moment in our life, and it was a call to repentance. When we arrived at home, Joan and I made an altar to the Lord. And let me say to you that it was a life-changing moment. It altered the direction of our lives. I can never forget it. 
It was so real, as I tell you today, I recall it. God met us in a unique way. He spoke highly significant words to our hearts. He impacted our future and the future of his church. Now watch this. When you respond to the encounters of God, when you make altars with God, and you get serious about the business of God, we are now 45 years later, and where we have served four churches, and we have touched hundreds of people's, of people's lives, we have preached in five of the seven continents in this world, and visited over 22 countries, telling thousands of people about the love and the goodness of God. I'm telling you, when you respond to these encounters with God, it will be life-changing, and it will set your life on a trajectory like you could never imagine. And so we see that with Abraham, but altars have a price. And God intends that something be altered in us when we come to altars. He intends that something be altered in you today, even as you take the bread, even as you take the cup. That there be something in you that would change. To see, to receive the promise means we make way for transformation. So I want to give you three stones that I see in this text that we're looking at today. I'm going to go very quickly so we can move to the table. Three stones to build in every altar of your life. The first stone is the stone of promise. Abram received the promise of the Lord. He knew that God was saying to him, there is a place for you. And I want to say to every one of you here today, there's a place for you. God has a place for you in his kingdom. Just like he had a place of promise for Abraham, he has a place for you. Because I believe that there's a longing in every human heart to know where I am meant to be. When the Lord told Abram he had a place for him, Abram probably thought, well, based on what he just said, it's probably going to look like a, a, a beautiful field, green and lush, little bubbling brook going through it, mountains in the back, snow capped, just a beautiful, beautiful picture. And he arrives to the place of God's promise, and the text says, the text says, there's Canaanites in the land. Well, don't read over that. That's an important part because Canaanites, the Canaanites were the most perverted, corrupt culture in human history. But when Abram builds an altar based on the promise that God has made to him, this is what Abram is saying. He's saying, I'm accepting a promise, understanding that it is different than what I thought it was going to be, but it's also something that I believe God can bring to pass. I trust you, Lord, that you will make it work. See, when God makes you a promise, there are times where you start stepping into the promise and you had one idea of what you thought it was going to look like and you get there and it's completely different. Can I get an amen? Amen. But this is what Paul said to the Corinthians. Paul said, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. You see, Paul, when he said yes to God, God brought him into an apostolic calling amongst the Gentiles. Well, you know what that looked like? It was full of difficulties and oppression. It was not an easy road, but he knew that that was the promise of God for him. And so he's not highlighting the difficulties. He's saying to the people, listen, I've learned to no matter how difficult it gets, even if there's Canaanites in the land, the yes of God, the promise of God is what I'm going to lean into. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying in Christ, God has said yes to every promise he has ever made. Folks, to Paul, Jesus was his anchor. And it was because Jesus was his anchor that he was able to pursue what he had been called into. How many of you have made Jesus Christ the anchor of your life? 
So that when you're looking at that promise that seems to be rather elusive or the ground looks a little different than you thought, that you can still hang in there and believe that God is going to do something. Because the boundless love of God is such that his promises never fail in Christ Jesus. Number two stone. The second stone is that of prayer. It says that Abram called upon the Lord. Now, as believers, as Christians, I know that every one of us understand the importance of prayer. But when the scripture says that Abram called on the name of the Lord, that word call there means to call out, to, to cry unto, invoking a person, calling a person by name, crying out to them and recognizing the surety of their character. It's like when a little child is on, a, on a, a playground and they stumble and they fall and they bump themselves and they hurt themselves. What do they cry out? Mommy, why? Because they are assured of her character. They know that she is going to come. She's going to rush in. She's going to sweep him up and, and take care of him and kiss the boo-boo and do all of those things. And I'm not necessarily saying that Jesus will come and kiss your boo-boo. But what I am saying is that the child cries out, not based on just a, a whim, but based on the character of mom. I know mom will show up. And when Abram called out or cried out to the Lord, he was doing it based on the character of God as he knew him. Now we have the advantage to know God even more. And so when you cry out to God, it should be based on the knowledge of who he is. In fact, Paul said to the Corinthians, he says in his opening letter, he says to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, the called saints with all those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place who is theirs and ours. The second stone that you want to build into your life is not only a reliance upon the promises of God, but when you pray, you are calling out, you are crying out to Jesus. And you're doing it based on his character. You're doing it based on the fact that you know that he loves you. It's sort of like this. This is how I do it. When I come, I just say, Jesus, I love you. And you are my good shepherd. You care for me. You trust. I trust you. Help me to understand your purpose in this. Help me to understand your promise in this. It's those moments where, where your reliance on God is not based just on theory, but it's based on a living relationship with a living God. I know him. I know he's true. I know he's just. I know he's kind. That song that we sung this morning, when I think of your kindness, when I think of your goodness, that's what I'm talking about. It had me crying this morning. When you think about the character of God and all that he's done for you, that's where you make an altar. And the last stone that I'm going to mention before we go to the communion table today it says that, that, that Abram left, but then he returns to where the Lord had met him. So you have the stone of promise, and then you have the, the stone of prayer, but then you have the stone of purpose. When you understand the promise of God over your life, and you begin to pray into it with a realization of how good God is and what he's leading you into. It gives your life a sense of purpose. You know what you're to be about. Even if you get off track a little bit. When the famine struck, Abram took, took things into his own hands. Have anyone ever done that? It just got a little severe. It got a little difficult. It got a little hard. And I know God's a busy guy. And he probably doesn't recognize how tough it's gotten for me right now. So I will be, uh, you know, I'll take some action here. I'm sure God will check off and sign off on it. And I'll just go over into Egypt where it's a little less severe. Anybody ever left the promise of God just because things got a little hard? We all fall for it. You know, maybe it has to do with your children. You have a promise for your children. You believe God's going to use them powerfully. You've had prophetic words spoken over your children when they were young. And then suddenly your child takes a left turn. 
And you're like, God, what about the promise? What about what you said? Why are they going that way? And suddenly we want to take things into our own hands and manipulate the situation just a little bit just to help God out. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your vocation. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your ministry. And and what I want to say to you is that Romans 8.28 says this to us. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who what? Love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God has a place for you. He's showing himself to you in that place. And when he shows you himself in that place, you don't ever have to worry about provision. I wonder what would have happened if Abram had just held steady and said, God, you promised this to us. I know this is severe. I know this is difficult, but I'm not moving because this is the place of your promise for me. Instead, he got in trouble with his wife. Honey, just say you're my sister. Wives, if you want to, you can elbow your husband on Sarah's behalf. This is the way it played out for me. When we made our way over to Canandaigua to be with Bob Sorge at Zion Fellowship, the first year we went in, Joan and I went in, and we were so excited. There, there seemed to be so much promise. We were so excited to be working alongside as Bob and Marcy's uh, associate. And, and, and we couldn't have thought uh, that there was a better place for us to be. The promise of God had followed us there. We're in it. But that first year, I was miserable. And about midway through that first year, a call came from the president of Elam, a church, a large church in Western Virginia had opened up, in West, not Western Virginia, but West Virginia, had opened up. And he was calling to find out if I wanted to take it. Now, we had just moved. And he said, I, I think you'd be a great fit, Chris. And when Bob found out, Bob was not pleased, but... but But it was a moment because it would have been really easy for me to say in that moment to say, yeah, you know what? I'm really not digging what's going on here. I think, yeah, I think I'll go over to Egypt because it'll be less severe there. But thank God that we didn't say that. We sung in there. We stayed in there with a little persuasion from Bob. He twisted my arm just a little bit. Because the offers can come and they can be tempting and they can try to draw us away from the real purpose of God. And I just wonder if there's some of you here today who you're just sitting in that place of promise and you're wondering, why is things so difficult? You need to make an altar with the Lord. And so let's go to the communion table now and, and prepare ourselves to receive the cup and the bread if the worship team would come and Joan's going to help me serve this morning. And remember, when Paul spoke about the communion table, he said this. He said, for I received from the Lord, from the Lord himself, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, while his betrayal was taking place, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this right here in remembrance of me. And that remembrance there is do it with with great affection. Do it with great passion. Remember what I've done for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, "This this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So this morning as we partake of this meal, we are saying, this is what we're saying. We're, we're, we're saying we believe, this is how you make an altar. We believe that in history, after Jesus Christ had come into the world, had lived his life, he actually gave his body to be crucified. He actually spilled his blood 
at the cross. And as we participate in this meal that he left for us, he is allowing us to have a share of that, to participate in that, to have fellowship with that. It's where we, the church of Jesus Christ, where we personally lay hold of the benefits of the cross, where we personally lay hold of the promise of forgiveness of sins, where we personally lay hold of, of the promise that, that we are counted righteous through Christ, where we personally lay hold of the promise to continue the work of, of making us holy by the grace of the Holy Spirit. This meal confirms our interest and our union with him, and it strengthens, it's meant to strengthen our communion with him as well. This is a living act. This is not some dead ritual. This is alive. It's filled with, with vibrant reality in God. And so Jesus instituted the sacrament as a sign, as a pledge of his love for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of his death until he comes again. And it's a spiritual sharing. We're sharing in his risen life. For in these holy mysteries that are before us, we are made one with Christ and Christ with us. And we are made one body in him. And we are members. Now look at each other. Members of one another. So we invite all of you who have left your life of sin and having received the fullness of God's forgiveness in Christ, knowing that your remaining infirmity is covered by his passion and his death. And if you desire to strengthen your faith today, draw near and take this sacrament to your comfort. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you who are rich in love and tender in mercy, who, give your, who gave your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by one offering of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. We ask, Father, that you would bless and sanctify with your word and by your spirit these elements and grant that we would receive them in remembrance of Jesus, his passion, his death, his resurrection, being made partakers of his divine nature through him. Amen. Let's worship. Come on, stand to your feet if you can.
bread. And after he had given thanks, which we do right now, Jesus, we are so thankful for you and what you've done for us. God, I thank you that even in this symbolic of your body being broken, God, you have provided all that we need through your life and your godliness, through your living, through your death, through your resurrection. God, we thank you. And he took the bread and he broke it. gave it to his disciples and he said this is my body as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me as often every time we break bread we remember his goodness his kindness his provision for us said, take the bread, take my body, eat all of it, giving him thanks and praise for the work that he has done. So Jesus, we thank you again and again and thank again. You, and we take your body in remembrance of you. Take and eat.
same way, we're told that when the supper was nearing its conclusion, he took the cup and again he gave thanks. And he gave it to them saying, drink all of this. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many and for, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, may it preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and feed on him in your heart by faith and thanksgiving. Amen. Heavenly Father, we have come to this table today, not on our own merit, nor do we presume to trust in our own righteousness, but resting in your love and in your manifold and great mercy, we ask that you would grant us to partake of this sacrament, the sacrament of your dear son, Jesus that we would be filled with the fullness of his life, growing into his likeness, dwelling forever in him and he in us. Amen. 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 So let me close our time together by just saying this, that you can build an altar today before the Lord. And you do that by just taking the broken things of your life, those things that didn't seem to work out, those things that seem to be unraveled. And you bring them to the Lord, you bring them to the altar of the Lord, those hard things, those broken things. You bring them before the Lord. And you say, Lord, I come. I come and I present myself to you. Because, folks, the price has been paid for your renewal. The securing of your hope is sure, never to be lost. The receiving of his promise, even if the environment seems a little unpleasant right now, his promises are sure. They are yes and they are amen in Christ Jesus. Amen. So as we close in worship this morning, if, if you just want to bring those broken things to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. I come to the cross, and that is where I find salvation. That is where I find redemption. That is where I find wholeness. That is where I find promise. As we worship, I encourage you just to come to the front. And make an altar with the Lord. No one's going to interrupt you. This is between you and Jesus. Just come to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I set this time apart. Let this be one of those moments in my life where, where I remember what you've done in my life today. I just feel like maybe some of us just need to make an altar with the Lord today. So worship team, if you just bring us back in, this will be our dismissal. But I encourage you to come forward and just spend a little bit of time with the Lord before you run off for coffee.
Okay. 